in the old days when you bought something off a rough looking market trader in a car park, you probably knew you weren't shopping at a reputable store and might be picking up something hooky or snide. But now sellers can hide behind flashy looking websites or even large established online retailers via marketplaces. The thing is, everybody likes to feel they're beating the system and getting a deal and to some, fake kit might seem like a great way to save money. They'll often assume it's all made in the same factory anyway, so why should they lie in the pockets of the fat cats? On the other hand, some might think they've found a great deal, not realising they're not getting the real thing. We've already covered the dodgy leathers we bought from Amazon with potentially dangerous fake armour in them. You can see that video up here and in the description. Now I've had Evotech Performance Rad Guards, tail tidies and crash protectors on my bikes for years. In fact, this one saved my S1000XR from damage. But it turns out you can get what looks to be the same gear for a fraction of the price online. So I bought some to find out how it really compares. I'm using Evotech as the example here, but they didn't pay for this video. We make content that we hope you'll enjoy and that ultimately builds awareness of the Bennetts and Bike Social brands. We do have a membership scheme that has massive savings on kit, accessories, track days, training, and a lot more. Check it out at bikesocial.co.uk forward slash join, as many of you who are Bennetts Insurance customers will already have full free access. Evotech does offer a 10% discount to members, but so do loads of others. Have a look and you'll see what I mean. Anyway, this oil cooler and rad guard costs £104.99 from Evotech. It came carefully packed in fully recyclable paper, tissue and card. All the fittings come with it, including these custom made rubber spacers. And the finish is incredibly precise with a fantastic powder coat. Honestly, it looks exquisite on this S1000XR. And the hardest part of fitting it was stripping the fairing off. And I can say from experience, it's not usually this involved. But there's a good reason that so many race teams use Evotech rad guards. I should say actually, this bike's £20,350 and a penny. So you've got to question why you'd be scrimping too much on something like this. But obviously they do kit for loads of bikes. But the thing is, you can get this same, well, same, rad protector and oil guard from AliExpress for about 20 quid. Now I'll show you what they're like in a minute, but first let's meet Chris and Dan from Evotech Performance in Lincolnshire. So yeah, just bear in mind you won't hear my question, but just start, you know, you just tell me, like you told me before, how did all this start? You started it, you can say it. <laughs> yeah, Evotech started in 2003. I needed a part for a CBR 954 at the time, it was a tail tidy. Tried to order one, couldn't get hold of one, so um, eventually I did get one. Uh, it took a long time to arrive, but when, when it did actually arrive, then realised that it was exactly what we're already manufacturing here, albeit that we don't do motorcycle parts. So um, it seemed only natural then to actually make one for myself. I made some extras, put them on eBay, sold them, at real low, low volume at the time, probably only five, something like that. They sold really quick, then made some more, 50, they sold, um, and then it just escalated from there. There was other models introduced, more tail tidies, but it very much did start off at tail tidies to start with. So talk, you know, talk me through how you're, how you're making it then. How, how do you get to those finished products that you're, you're producing? Well, towards the end of the season, the, um, the bike shows, Milan, NEC, those kind of things will all be on. Uh, we'll make sure that we can attend those. And at that point, we'll be uh, recceing what bikes will be coming out for next year. Certainly the brand new models, and then there'll be other models such as, like, the, just almost a continuation. Um, and at that point, we'll be assessing them to see what parts fit existing um, and, and starting to make a list, a bit of a wish list almost, of what is going to be coming out um, and what bikes we actually want um, as soon as they become available. But, of course, we... we we're only as good as the availability of the bikes. We can want them all day long, but of course, um, uh, if we can't get hold of them straight away, then that can often dictate what bikes come in first. Um, but that does necessitate us to purchase the bike sometimes. Well, right. on regular occasions where we literally have to put our money in a so hand in our pocket and buy them. Yeah. Around the tier, you bought these to be able to do the this vast majority of these. Yes. Yeah. So we've we've probably got what eight odd bikes on the fleet at the moment. Yeah. But we, we, we do real world testing as well. <coughs> we will go out and test the parts on the bikes and, to make sure they work in, in, 
in their functionality and their longevity as well, so yeah. to make sure they will last the distance. Yeah. We um, don't get to ride them as much as we want, though, do we? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a hell of an investment, you know, already, to do this. So I would yeah. probably say, actually, I, I think you, you two kind of divide your time, don't you? Do, Chris, you tend to do the rad guards, uh, and Dan, do you tend to do like the crash protection? Yeah, that yeah. tends to be it. Your yeah. red cars, so, tail tires. My, so. my areas are <coughs> tail tidies, yeah. uh, radiator cool guards, so oil cooling guards, yep. Uh, sat nav mounts, exhaust hangers, um, and uh, engine guards, um, and other. Uh, there is a few other line sim similar or sort of more simple line items and things like that. Yeah. That's you say good. simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not quite. <laughs> and, uh, and Dan, your um, primarily the crash protection, spindle bobbins. More recently, we've been doing hand guards, brake protectors, barons, those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, you, presumably you're going to be doing all of that for that decay. Everything we possibly can. What? What? what how do you start it? Where? Where do you begin? Well, there's, there's, I'd refer to it as a low-hanging fruit. You'd see what is either something already fits it from a, a previous model, or there'll be it'll be quite a, a relatively straightforward project to do. But in the background, you, your thinking head will be on for the stuff that's tricky. That particular one is going to be quite tricky for some. Parts. How do you, you know, where, where do you use a reference point to measure? You know, are you measuring from the axle or something? That's the three D scanner. That's right. so the three D scanner. People can sort of think of three D scanning and printing as though it magically produces the part for you, but it doesn't. <laughs> it, it gives you the building blocks to start the design process from. Yeah. So effectively, you're going to take the the motorcycle and put it onto your into your three D environment on your desk. And once you've got that, then then the design starts. And that's where you work on the computer to, to work out how you're going to make these parts. Bit. Yes, that's the way yeah. the CAD bit starts. And how long does it typically take on something? You know, you can have some quite complex <coughs> parts. How long do you say it takes you to develop between you? How many hours Crikey. of work is it? A simple bit you could have almost complete in a day in terms of you could be virtually ready production for a, a simple yeah. part. Yeah. But for a tricky bit, you, yeah, you could yeah. be months. Really? Yes. I mean, yeah, some yeah. of them are so hard to get your head around yeah. Yeah. Um, that you need so much digestion and thinking time on it. E even up to a year, the, th the, the thinking time is one of the hardest parts and it's sometimes the thing that keeps you awake at night and, or, or gets you to sleep at night. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so this, this Street Fighter V2, new yeah. bike, just come in um, and um, it was scanned yesterday for radiator guards and now the radiator guards will start to be designed and I would hope to have those radiator guards done in two days in terms of design, yeah. ready for pre-production. Yeah. And I think this is where we probably need to explain something. You know, the best way I'd kind of say it is, what would you say to people who are saying, you know, we're here to talk about fake kit, uh, and we're gonna get into that a little bit more, but what would you say to people? Be like, well, it's all made in the same factory probably anyway, isn't it? Um, simply not true, <laughs> yeah, not, not, not true at all. It, it, there's a huge investment, um, there's a huge investment leading up to production and there's a huge investment in production in terms of machinery um, and that no it's not all produced in the same factory at all <laughs> um, so, and, and actually uh, you know, the, we'll already be showing some shots on the screen now but what we're talking about is production that's happening behind that wall correct yes uh, yeah. right here in Alford yes you're making all of this yourself absolutely so it simply yeah. can't be made in the same factory because you make it that's it and, uh, what kind of investment is that in equipment millions now, um, presumably it, some of that it, has come from your background as Drew Precision, where you were making very high-end, incredibly accurate parts for critical businesses, uh, medical and everything, weren't you? And he, uh, but yeah. have you still had to keep investing since then? So we've invested heavily across the board. Yeah. By the Brand way, our, kit. our investment is not only in the machinery, but it's in our staff as well. Yeah. Um, and our quality control procedures. We, we're, we're, we have a, a, a very careful quality control procedure that... Um, we all adhere to and we can actually stamp uh, a quality mark on the parts. That's the ISO 9001, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can trace every part who made it, but not just that, you can trace the materials where you source the materials and everything, can't yes. you? That's right, yeah. Apple so full trace with any part that they bought from yeah. EvoTech Performance, not something yeah. that might look a bit like EvoTech Performance. <laughs> yeah. So it's fair to say, isn't it, that you, you might say, you yeah, know, that... that that Street Fighter, we want to make parts for that. Buy the bike, you 3D, I'm simplifying this, I know, but you 3D <laughs> scan the bike, yeah. you, you get all that data onto your computer, you design the parts, 
to, to fit on there and then you make them out there. Presumably you can't make everything. I know you're using plastics and stuff in there. I didn't see any um, vacuum forming or anything in there. Where are you getting these stuff done? Are you shipping stuff in from factories in China that are making it for other people? Uh, no, we do subcontract and, and wherever possible we will use local subcontractors and then radiate outwards um, yeah. to the next nearest subcontractor that can do the job for us. So, so it's all still within so, the UK, isn't it? In yeah, terms of Yes, injecting, yeah. moulding, yeah. vacuum forming. And, and this is the stuff that is being made for you. And these, these companies aren't making it for anybody else. Nope. Look, I feel like I want to I wanna show you some of the stuff, some of the fakes, because that's what we're here to talk about. But, you know, have a look at these, see what you think. Um, you might notice some marks on them. That, that's not, although I've fitted them and taken them off, the marks were there originally. Um, so they're about 20 quid from AliExpress. And they're S1000 RR. Well, you'd know what they're for because you'd recognize the shape. Yeah. Mine's crap. What's yours like? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not so good. There's, there's, there's a, an area where it's dented there. There's a hanging mark there from painting. And they're, and they're, they're painted, aren't they? But your stuff's yeah. powder coated. Mm. Yes, yes, this is painted. You notice the, it, little, um, the little divots there. Yeah, that, that can be a weak point. It can definitely, that's a fracture um, point. Um, that, um, can I but it's also it? a bit of lazy modelling, isn't it? I don't know if you can see on camera, they don't line up at all. But yeah, that, I couldn't, the, they the didn't line up when I put it together. Yeah. That curve doesn't look anywhere near enough, does it? No. Um, can I have a look the, at that? The holes are a lot, are clearly a lot bigger in this one. Yeah. Obviously gonna, and it actually it, came with these yeah. rubber, these are the fitting parts that it came with. Okay. So if you want to try and put one of those rubber lungs in. <laughs> I just, oh, I can course. see. I can see why it's not going to fit now as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't get it on, um, but these, these lugs here that go behind the um, top of the radiator, they, they're not in the right place, so it keeps yeah. falling off the, off the front um, of the bike, which does vary a uh, Presumably you've got a bit of a responsibility when you make stuff to make sure it's not going to make the bike dangerous. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's almost the, the um, first thing you sort of consider, isn't it? The, uh, there's no foam. There should be a piece of foam that sits on the bottom of the, um, the oil cooler to protect it. That's missing. Yeah. Um, and they were actually but, very loose on there. Yeah. Uh, like I said, the top would fall off. The, these that, arms didn't fit yeah. in the oh. space for, between the oil cooler and the radiator. I had to bend them to get them to fit. And then, like you say, the, yeah. the two lugs that put well, together didn't line up. It's almost just, as if they were a visual copy, but the, yeah. it's quite clearly they're not. One thing I'd no, notice is that there's a big board around this. Mm. They've used such big holes that they can't get the holes close to the edges. Yeah. Therefore, this isn't going, in theory, probably not going to cool as efficiently as ours. And the holes oh, are bigger, which also can let smaller debris through to the radiator cells. Yeah. And um, you can't space it off the radiator properly. Yeah. It, it, the it's, whole thing sits quite proud of the radiator because it's not wrapping yeah. back against the rad. Like, yeah, like so... Because I know yes. that must be quite a comp... How, how... There's probably some processes that you don't want to give away, but yeah. you know, uh, looking it's, at your radiator guards, they're quite... It's a complex curve. Yeah. It, yes. Is that special... Like special skills to do yeah. that. Uh, yeah, that particular uh, uh, is a highly skilled job, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the, the press brake operators, um, they're very, very skilled in what they do. And that, that means they'll be consistent about the curve we put in there. Yeah. They've got jigs and templates to work to, so they can absolutely guarantee that everyone is within 0.25 mil. Yeah, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, consistency. Um, this, by the way, this is, uh, this is laser cut. On there, you can feel the the start and stop point just there. So that's a, that's how they produce this. We do we don't we don't laser cut ours. Um, but uh, and yeah, yeah. Uh, the, there's something I think you mentioned what? before that the, the way you're making things you've taken into account as well that everything has to be perfectly smooth and well finished because then you get a better consistency of the not the painting. I mean, in your case, it's powder coating. But there's more integrity in yeah. the powder and coating. And you're doing that powder coating here as well, aren't you? Yes. You are literally start to finish. It is everything from yeah. from pad printing the logo onto the powder coating. Well, from it's, design, it's all done from design. To it's cradle to grave. On to packaging it and sending it to somebody's house. Yes. Any, well, anywhere in the world. Every single bit. Yeah. So there's another one here. I actually think this one isn't as bad. Okay. This seems a bit closer. By the way, an observation: these holes are off centre. <laughs> <laughs> so they're both the same price, and that's I think one of the other problems here. Yeah, we've got one there. It's actually not that bad. That uh, perforation is a lot. Um, Either that's a smaller um, hexagon or the the point to point's different. Yeah. Looks, there's too much land on that, isn't there? 
That, yeah, that does yeah, look there's... a bit better than the other one, yeah. Yeah, um, th but there's still some of the, in fact, you can see the rippling of the material there. That's, that'll fracture. You seen that? You can see the rippling as it stands yes, again. Yes, yes, yeah. Again, laser cut. And this um, one actually fit. Yeah. That, that one went on pretty well. It came in some foam tape. I'm surprised it's still on there because the sticky yeah. had come off, but it seems yeah. to have managed to stay on. It went on in pretty well the right place. If you notice, it's got the pressed in threads. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of them, I left it as it came. You can see the threads damaged on the other one. Well, you can see they've not actually been, these are clinch fasteners, you see, they're not rivet bushes. And they, uh, they rely on being pressed in um, correctly, and they are not correctly. Basically, they'll fall out. Yeah, all right. Yeah. That's, that's even worse. They haven't even actually put the pre-purse hole the right size on it. I mean, it's, it's shoddy, very shoddy. Mm. That would be, yeah, that's, that's rubbish. And if you have a look yeah. at the fixings, that, oh, you've seen it, look, the pre-purse yeah. is wrong. Oh, yeah. Apart yeah. from the foam tape, it came with a, uh, a length of foam tape, so not pre-cut or anything. Uh -huh. They're the fixings that came with it. And <laughs> you might notice something about those set screws compared to those threads. Well, that yes. looks like a, an M. Yeah. Probably actually an M. That looks like a thin M6, doesn't it? They're the same yeah. as. Uh, but, uh, your, but that's what so the same for? size as you're These. using, because I had to use your screws. So, to, so, so they're M5s, and yeah. that. So that's a an M5 insert with a an M4 screw. Yeah. It doesn't right. go. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work <laughs> Obviously, um, it just falls out. Um, it's so, it's a bit better than the other one, but it's still does, pretty. Does shit. it line up? The funny thing is, though, when buying them on on buying them online, mm -hmm. they both look the same as each other on the listing yeah. mm -hmm. and neither looked like what you got. So you don't know what you're going to receive. Well, the, some, on some of the counterfeit parts, they will actually use our photos. They'll steal really? our photographic. We spend a lot of money getting the photos done on the bikes. Yeah. So th there's our individual photos of the actual product and then the ones where the, the studio shots of the stuff on the bike. Yeah. And they'll literally lift that and just copy it. Yeah. So you don't actually know what you're going to get. Yeah, look, look, while you're looking at that, let me, let me have a look at, uh, well, let's try this one first. So here we have a set of, well, you know what they are, a set of axle protectors. Mm. Uh, let's tell what you think about these. I can sort of magnetic. tell straight away that they're, they're not ours. How? Well, how can you tell even before I hand them to you? Uh, well, straight away that these are actually made from, um, these are M8, but they're made from 8mm bar, and the actual threads are screw cut rather than forged thread. So what we do is we actually re roll thread ours but we don't do any cutting process on them, which, which basically means it, it retains its integrity. It's rock hard threads then. Yeah. Um, so that's an eight mil bar. We, we use a reduced diameter and, and um, use a roll threading process. They're also threaded equally at the either end, which means that effectively you could tighten it up and pull it the assembly that way, so then it won't fit. So uh, we, have yeah, a, we, have, we have a we have like a, a short amount of thread, and then which then gets bottomed out, and this side gives you the adjustment. So that um, means you don't have a bit of thread sticking out on one side. You have a perfectly fitted part. Exactly. Always balance fits, basically, so right. the way that we do it. But of course, it's, for someone to go and copy, it's easy to copy things like that, yeah. where all of that hard work's been done for them. Yeah. But of course, we do that on screen when, after a scan, yeah. and we, we'll actually level it all out. That's it. You so know, those... you've, you've put all this development work into this. It's the unseen side of buying a product. Uh, and people might complain that they're, oh, why does it cost so much when they can make it for 20 quid? So you're like, well, Ignoring the quality of parts, quality of materials, traceability, mm. working conditions, staffing <coughs> costs, everything like that. It's the fact that they haven't had to buy a motorbike, buy all the equipment to 3D scan it. Uh, years of experience of knowing how to do it, doing all the design work, your time in doing the design work, doing all the development, mm. and then putting it into production. Exactly. I mean, it's, that, that to me is straight fake. So if you, if you see an evil, even amount then you, a, a thread, you'll know that that's a counterfeit. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so what else, is, well, I mean, how does it make you feel when you see your logo on there? Well, that's a, that's a trademark infringement rather than a, a, a sort of an, uh, an IP infringement, but it's know, absolutely it's, horrible, yeah. yeah. Because, but in a way, it's sort of, it's good that they, they think our stuff's good enough to copy, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gutting. It's, it's, not, it's not a nice thing to sort of have to see and then try to police and do something about. Yeah. Yeah. Effectively, they're trading off the back of our name and it, that's not a nice feeling at all. Yeah. Um, so when, um, if that thread fails yeah. and it's got our name on it, yeah. It, it, everyone's asking the questions why our stuff has actually gone wrong, but yeah, of course it isn't. Not. No, but it's a very yeah. You know, it, so there's significant potential damage to a brand because somebody posted on a forum <coughs> that their axle protectors fail. They've had they've had a problem with it. Yeah. Uh, it, it. It reflects poorly on you, even though it's absolutely nothing to do with you. you know, absolutely, and yet convincing people of that is 
goes right back to the, oh, it's made from the same factory, mate, when it obviously isn't. Yeah. You know, it, it, we've got a machine specific for putting those threads on, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it does it in a way that is... Um, this is quite a minor thing, out. I think, relatively, because, yeah, you know... Absolutely. It's... And yet convincing people of that is goes right back to the, oh, it's made from the same factory, mate, when it obviously isn't. Yeah. You know, it, 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 we've got a machine specific for putting those threads on, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it does it in a way that is... Um, this is quite a minor thing, out. I think, relatively, because you know, it's a relatively simple part. But uh, going back to Rad Protect a minute, uh, years ago, we did something with the ago, and I think you mentioned about, it's the fact that you will support people. And if, if, somebody, if somebody's got a problem with a, a part that they bought from you, or they're, 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 they're not sure how to fit it or something, I, I think people don't realise that if they call up and say, oh, I don't know how to fit this, yeah. they're probably going to come through to either of you two who designed it in the first place and you can help Yeah, they, they probably won't get straight to us, but they'll get straight to the, the, the EvoTech team who will yeah. literally tell them exactly what to do or support them. They may have, I don't know, cross-threaded a bolt or yeah. they might have lost a part. And we'll just send it, no problem. Yeah, yeah. In most instances. <laughs> yeah. Is there something else you've noticed about those, the, the um, bungs the, on the end? Yeah, the, the finish of the bungs is, it's a sort of a copy of ours, but it, it is, um, it isn't the same. This They're, is aluminium. Uh, yeah. Are they aluminium? Yeah. 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 Well. I think that's what you said, yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you know, I actually haven't picked up on that, but yes, of course. Um, so that means that they won't do the job. Um, so, so you, you, what do you use on yours? Yours is like a, a plastic material, is it? It has a just, you know, injection molded um, nylon. Okay. As a specific nylon. Um, they're designed to sort of add a little bit of friction um, so that, you know, aluminium will typically slide. It, it's not going to be as grippy as your right. nylon or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and that's why on the bigger crash protection bolts, there's, a, there's sort of a hybrid of the two. Yeah. One gives the sort of the good connection to the bike, which is the aluminium, and the, the nylon gives you the almost the shock absorbing from an initial hit, okay. and then also the, the, the sort of resistance to the road to try to slow the job down a bit. Yeah, because uh, especially on a big bike, we should have a look at one in a minute. I guess, uh, <coughs> you, you know, it, it feels kind of hard to lay with those, but actually it's surprisingly soft and a surprising amount of give within that material. Yes. Uh, so... That's basically so, it's the so, wrong thing so, to do. So yeah. this is going to transfer the shock straight from the road, straight into the chassis of the bike. Right. So you haven't um, got a bumper. There's, 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 yeah, there's no absorption in that whatsoever. But what we try so, to do is that there's a, there's a fractional little dimension in there that allows the nylon just to be able to rotate when it's done up. Yeah. Just that little bit. So that what it does is it doesn't just wear in one place, it can sort of skid around. I noticed that. And, it, it, it's, it, and that's... That won't do that because I've just pushed that up there, and that won't it won't rotate. Yeah. So you're literally just digging aluminium straight in the road. I mean, technically, it'll it'll probably save some, but yeah, I've, I've guess, always yeah. wondered why they looked a bit sharper, and now that I know they're aluminium, yeah. and um, the reason they're in aluminium is because it's dead easy for them to do. Yeah, because right. turning aluminium is dead easy. You turn in nylon, it's it's absolute nightmare. This this part here's got a mark on it. Look. Oh yeah, so that's actually that's, from the subspindle. That, yeah. yeah. So it, it, again. Poor quality. Even the little finesse you see that they just copy. I mean, these are an easy thing for them to copy, and it's yeah. sort of, but they've gone the whole hog and actually not just copied the part, so they've actually copied the um, trade. there, which we can see why it is, but uh, you mentioned something earlier about it. Some, some copies have used plastic as well. So is plastic plastic? Or, you know, is there a difference between oh, why totally, are you using yes. the nylon you're using? Well, without getting into all of the different materials, some materials can fracture. Um, so if it was to take an impact, it would literally smash to pieces, if you think about the Beacon crash protection. We <laughs> have <laughs> tested crash protection. Right. Uh, and uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think you said, you, didn't you see some fakes that were using a seat or nylon? And that, that gets very brittle when it's cold, is it? Yes, that, that is a particular one that um, we have definitely seen that. Okay. So, so effectively, they just almost make it up <laughs> and make it look like ours. Yeah. Uh, so the shape and the size of the actual bobbin head, you, but on on a screen, you just think you're getting the same thing. Yeah. It's, obviously, it's nowhere near. Now I've seen these. I mean, to, to, from layman's point of view, they've got machined parts that look very similar. Cheapers. It's not very well finished, but um, no, but, I know. But it's ultimately, sharp edges, but it still, but, it seemed to me, it looks like a piece of machine. I mean, it's, it's but, literally a direct copy of ours. But um, what? But what material is it? And is there a difference uh, with aluminium then? I know yes, there's, there's, there's a lot huge of marketing difference, terms yeah. around aluminium, aren't there? But yeah. you, and I know you can trace your stock. But how much difference? Uh, oh, don't look at that just yet. I'll oh, come mm. back to that. But how much difference can there be between an aluminium? Oh, massive! Um, huge differences. Um, 
uh, if this was um, a 5000 series grade, it might be too soft, right. so therefore it might bend rather than resist uh, any um, impact. See, my worry um, there is, um, in an impact, that, that's potentially going to handle a lot of load, and it's yeah. bolted into the lugs on your engine. Yeah. And if you transfer the wrong load to the engine, yeah. and snap the lugs, yeah. it could, it could be more damage than Absolutely, and it could be catastrophic, that damage. Um, where you'd be better not having the crash protection in the first place. Yeah. Um, but this could be, there's also not only different, <laughs> <laughs> different grades uh, uh, of, there's not only different grades of aluminium, but there's also different manufacturing processes. You get cast aluminium, rolled aluminium, and th that's all to do with the grain structure and how ours are tested and have the a consistent grain structure to the material. Yeah. Um, so who knows what you're getting, but we can guarantee what we're getting. Yeah. We've got traceability. Yeah. We'll have a look at the bungs on this then. So they've ripped off the logo on that one, exactly. Yes, um, they may as well have just done it on that one as well, haven't yeah, they, really? Sure oh. Oh. Yes. Crikey. I mean, that's just not the way it was intended. I mean, when I designed that bobbin head, we originally made it all in plastic, um, or nylon. We did it, and later down the line, we, we did it where basically the alumin the core was aluminium, yeah. and then the, the outer was then injection molded around that aluminium. The idea of that was that it gives it, the aluminium gives you a really good mechanical connection to the bike. Yeah. The problem with injection molding of plastics, especially where they're thicker, um, or in, in different thicknesses around the part where there's a thin bit and a thick bit, is that when they, the, the cooling rate, you, you struggle to keep the accuracy of the part, so they were needing to be pre-finished. Yeah. But the aluminium core gives you a good weight. This is too heavy. But <laughs> well, the aluminium aluminium core gives you a good weight. It means that you can bolt it to the bike with absolute precision accuracy, yeah. but then the nylon does the job that it's supposed to do in terms of the initial impact, the abrasion resistance and those kind of things. For them to literally either paint or anodise a piece of aluminium is just rubbish. So that's going I mean, to transfer the shock straight into your engine? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, straight into the bike uh, as it drops down. And yeah, so it's... It's, it's just, it, it's not fit for purpose. It looks like our part, but yeah. and people might think it's our part, but it's nothing like it. It's the, the original concept and it just, it wasn't that. And the amount of people that's crashed on these things now and they just do the job perfectly, and yet that wouldn't do it. Yeah, sorry, the yeah. amount of people crashed on yours. Absolutely, yeah, not yes. on those. So we, yeah. we get a lot of testimonials. I mean, there's, they often tell you that you only ever really hear the, the bad news, you never hear the good stuff. But, yeah, yeah. but with the crash protection, the, the, there's, we've got so many testimonials now. Well, um, nearly nice. always on the 1290 KTM. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. so going back to that um, injection molding around the aluminium, Presume that's not an off-shelf process. You know, you, you've you've made those aluminium inserts, and then you've had to have the tooling produced to specifically injection mold that stuff. The concept was entirely as when we decided we wanted to go down that road. We designed it. Yeah. We liaised with the injection molders. Um, yeah with our injection moulders, and we now supply them with those inners, and then they do the injection moulding and supply the part back. And you know, that's presumably a relatively <coughs> costly process, but it's not something you've decided to do for shits and giggles. You know, well, you've got yes, yes, up, that's, that's, that's a good expensive. point. There's, you know, there's, there's other processes involved, which suddenly means that it is more expensive, but it, it was what we wanted to do, yeah. and it would also set us apart, because the quality, that's the best one you could possibly and do. you can't even see it. It's no. not a cosmetic process that you've done go, it's expensive, but look how look how neat it looks. You can't even see it. But when Once someone picks it up yeah. and then goes, oh yeah, yeah. and it, that's that bit that you cannot get across on an eBay advert or AliExpress yeah. or something. I mean, We've got to mention those. Uh, so, uh, and also I think, uh, something I probably should have mentioned that, you know, I, I dropped my XR, but then I was able to get a new bung off you and just put a new one on. Hmm? Uh, and I suppose people might think, oh, well, I'll just put your bungs on this stuff. Apart from the fact that we don't know there's something else I'll bring up in a second. But actually, the threading is different on them. You, you make all your own bolts here as well, don't you? For, for the main um, crash protection bolts, so typically your M10s, M12s, we actually produce those in-house yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So we've got full control over consistency, quality, and all those kind of things. Because these are using coarse 1.75 threads, you're using 1.25 when it's measuring them. So you couldn't even go, oh, so I'll get some genuine stuff and put that on. But there's something I don't think, I wouldn't have, yeah, they're the bolts that it comes with. And I, I know, presumably they pretty much do the job, but we, most of us buy motorcycles because of the beauty and the details. Yeah. Well, and the beauty and the detail of a stainless steel. Could we, could we test these? Uh, 
I can quickly test that to see. That looks to like a mile, mile steel to me. The yeah, thing is, which, which will correct? No, no, they're actually they're they're the full deal because they're like twelve point nine. They'll they're be definitely brittle. Yeah. Yeah, They've but are, are they mild steel though? Oh, they will be. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, in other words, they'll corrode. In that sense, they will, but they are chemically blacked, aren't they? But what they, we, I mean, we see our bolts as a bolts as hard. They're, they're hard to source Sorry, consistently. Go, go for it. Yeah. Go. <laughs> uh, what you need. We, that actually, there's a magnet on there. Yep. Mild steel. Right. Oh. <laughs> That's just made them better. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so because then obviously. Because you went to rigorous testing procedures on the stainless, didn't you, to make sure? So, yeah. so you could say, oh, yours are. Um, well, they, uh, they are, a, I suppose. A proven grade. <laughs> we, we would. What we were struggling with the reason. I mean, even the, the the poor bolts that we were getting were nicer than these. But the the problem we was getting was a consistent supply, especially when the bolt lengths get a lot longer. So, we we realised that what we needed is to take control. So we we invested in a new machine and we make our own bolts now. And that means that the consistency of bolt is absolutely perfect. We get, we, we get to make, basically make the bolt exactly how we want it to be um, with the consistent materials um, and so on. But they are, I wouldn't want those on my bike. They're just, they're just horrible, aren't they? Yeah. Just, I think it's that yeah. detail in, in there. I wouldn't necessarily expect you to spot this, but if we have a look, not the beer. So that's one of the spacers. Okay. Can you see anything different between yours? I should have, it's no bad reflection on it if you don't notice. Think about where it goes. It'll probably, um, oh actually, is this one supposed to have a peg on the other side as well? Yeah, recess to that. Yeah, yeah so, so what happens is it will recess to the frame on one bit and on the, because the front of this one on the left, I, I believe that we have a little subspace that goes in the back, but we actually use the standard bolt on the front left on one of those. And then on the back, they sort of connect into that and then into the bike. So, do they have like a double top out? Yours does. Yes. Yeah, it, so, it's what? So that's it's just sat on. Yeah. So they've copied so, the bracket, but then haven't. That's that, that's where I, this is exactly the same overall height as your one. Oh. But this one. Yeah. yeah. But it sits on it sits, it sits on the ledge. On the ledge. So, so that, the other that won't part fit then. is the correct length. But when you compare them, it's about two mil. Higher on one side with this one. Yeah, you're, yeah, there'll be a three mil recess in the back of that. Three mil, yeah. And you, what, what you'll be doing, you'll be asking for trouble then, because when you actually bolt it up, it'll it'll start to load the bracket, yeah. and it's almost putting stress in it, so that when it actually does take an impact, obviously it's going to try and release that stress yeah. somewhere. So um, you'd have thought that if they were going to copy it, they would actually just copy it. Yeah. But then that's, I didn't know that. You just assume that they just do a dead copy. So, of course, instantly there's a fitting issue, a safety issue. It could be that when you're tightening it up, then you're loading it up, then you're loading your threads in your bike. Those threads are in your engine. Yeah, once you snap that. You know, if that goes you're in, blocked. you're in trouble. Yeah. And, and that's another good reason, try, trying to avoid having 1.75 threads in there and 1.25 for everything else. Because if you accidentally use that bolt and screw it in, you will cause some serious damage. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then it's an engine out job and so on. So, you know, at face that looks pretty much like ours, but you could cause yourself a lot of problems if you tried to yeah. fit that. Yeah. Especially okay. if you was a bit, you know, if you didn't quite know what you were doing. Do you, um, I know you, you don't know how they made this, but could they have, <coughs> would that have been lathed when that was done? Because presumably you've got some pretty complicated machining equipment, haven't you? Uh, you know, your mills and your lathes, you've got some robotically controlled equipment, you've got, you've got stuff that takes it and moves it, and I can't get my head around a lot of the stuff you have, but if you're turning that on a fairly traditional lathe, obviously you can turn that bit down, but then mm. when you get to the end, you're cutting off, because how are you, could it have been a decision? They go, well, we don't need to do that lip, just cut it, off. It could be, if you're using part. a single head lathe, then, um, or a single spindle lathe, then you would just you could just part off that and let it sort of fall down, but they'd they'd need to debear that. In fact, that is that isn't debear. In fact, you're right. That has actually got a bear lip yeah, on the so, inside. So, so, so what they've done is yeah. they've parted that off, yeah. and then they haven't finished it. So, so it would have it, needed a, a second op to finish that. Exactly. With yeah. a second spindle machine, yeah. you would you would pass yeah. the part over and then work the back so, and then drop it out the machine. So they had two choices. They either knock it out cheap. Mm. Or they add another production process, taking that part out, turning it around, re machine it. Mm -hmm. Or they invest in the equipment that can do it twice. Yeah. Some of those things you made, you, you, there was a part of a tail tidy from something in it. The, the intricacy in it was incredible. Are, are, they faking, are there some stuff that you've seen they're not faking because it's just beyond what they can make? Almost we, certainly. Yeah, we yeah. believe so. It's just too hard for them to make. Yeah. Um, and it really does take a lot of investment to 
manufacture those. Yeah. So by the time they've invested in the manufacturing to make them, then they're the same price as ours anyway. So therefore, it's, we, not, worth it's, not, it's not worth going to China when you can source them much more locally yeah. um, from the proper company that makes them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, they, 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 even though they have to invest to try to produce some of these fake parts, they've cut out all of that beginning bit, yeah. all of it. That huge, yeah. I mean, I, you know, when I'm sort of, I'm working over there and I'm watching Chris scratching his head, wondering how the hell he's going to make the next thing, yeah. and, and vice versa. Right, so, and yeah, yeah. Like, like we say, sometimes that can take weeks, months of yeah. just digesting and just, just mulling it over. And it can lead you down some really, like, smart paths and you can design some really cool stuff. Yeah. And it, some of that does not come easy at all. And, uh, and how it, does it make you feel when, you know, you put a lot into that and you see somebody's going, yeah, that works, right, yeah, copy that, done. Well, if, if you focus on how it makes you feel at first, it makes you feel fantastic to think that somebody in, I don't know, like Australia suddenly wants one of your parts. When you actually see it pop up somewhere and then someone says, wow, that's ace, and they, yeah. they give you the feedback and they tell you it's great, you almost remember those first times and it makes you feel fantastic. But then it's, it, it, it's, it's hard to actually say how bad it makes us feel when we see the first time that a copy pops up, especially when it is something that's a bit more um, yeah. close to us. Because one copy leads to another. If they get their hands on a copy, then pretty soon there's 12, there's 15, there's 20 copies all appearing. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really frustrating, yeah. Really. It does cause it, sleepless nights, especially yeah. when we was encountering it first. You was you, you almost couldn't comprehend exactly yeah. how you were going to stop this. Yeah. It's, because it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it was it, just it, relentless. It's almost depressing at times. Mm. Um, but... We, we have to stay positive and we have to carry on, so, yeah. And ultimately, yeah. I still get the impression you guys enjoy what you're doing here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, almost, it, it yeah. could almost be a, a thing now to try and make it so hard to copy that they can't copy it. Actually, the copies are taking out the enjoyable bit for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dan and Chris are really modest guys, but they're also incredibly passionate about what they do. Something they didn't mention in that interview is how they're spending well into six figures a year fighting these fakes. That's how much it's how much they're losing and how much it makes it worth. It's it's not just the money. They're wasting huge amounts of time that could be spent designing parts for other bikes. And these fakes also damage their brand as some people don't realize they've got a knockoff, then complain on forums when it doesn't fit or worse, it causes damage. There's also the fact that these counterfeiters dodge paying tax and import duty, so not only are they harming British industry and jobs, they're avoiding contributing to our economy altogether. Now, EvoTech is pretty unique in that it does all this design, development and manufacturing right here in the UK. And a little bonus here, all the Ron Hasm race school bikes were fitted with EvoTech crash protection, which was handy when Joe, who shot the interview with Chris and Dan, rode one of their bikes. Anyway. EvoTech is just one example of what's a massive problem. So I spoke to Phil Lewis, Director General of the Anti-Counterfeiting Group. The Anti-Counterfeiting Group has been going for 40 years. It started in 1980. And it was at the time when uh, counterfeiting was very much a cottage industry at the time. It was, it was quite small. It was, I would say, in-house in a sense that a lot of the counterfeits were kind of manufactured and developed within, uh, within the UK back there. Okay. Uh, we were seeing um, uh, Chinese counterfeits, but generally um, they were low key, they were pretty shoddy, easily identifiable, you know, very cheap um, yeah. knockoffs. And um, they generally focused on fashion wear, football shirts, those sorts of things. And in those days, you could hold them up, the football shirts and, and see through them, you know, I mean, <laughs> around about 2001 it started the picture started to change and we began to see uh, a higher influx of um, of counterfeits coming from overseas particularly southeast asia and um and they were much more sophisticated yeah so um they began to have a real impact on on um uk and european businesses at the time yeah. uh, because they were actually replacing the originals now, they began to focus on, on stuff that was fashion wear, footwear, handbags, leather handbags, those sorts of things, luggage. And they began to, uh, and it was the first time where I think we really began to see um, high, high volumes of uh, perfume, aftershaves, those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, so um, 
in those days, um, the government hadn't really been involved and I was working in government at the time and uh, there was a huge lobbying. Uh, lobbying had increased quite considerably and government began to take notice uh, because it was having an economic Im impact at the time, you know, not to the extent it is now. I would say that at that time it was 1% of the size it is now. So, really? we, we, yeah, well, we'll talk about this, but it was still damaging. Yeah. So what happened was that um, the government decided that we needed some sort of strategy to um, to prevent and tackle this this growing problem, and uh, that's where I came into it, uh, working at the intellectual property office at the time. What what what's happened is since then is a huge increase in the the, the products we we see uh, in our households. Yeah. So, and also the products that we see in the automotive industry, uh, the products that we see in pharmaceuticals, all of these began to be exploited by the counterfeiters. And the machine, um, the counterfeiting machine clearly was in China. And at the moment, uh, China and Hong Kong are responsible for about 83% of fakes around the world. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's far more sophisticated. Um, they're not as easily identifiable, um, and they are creating. It's creating havoc. Um, I'll just give you some figures. Um, the extent of counterfeiting around the world now, in terms of value of trade, is four hundred sixty-four billion dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, and and this figure doesn't include domestically produced. <coughs> counterfeits, which there are far less of. Intellectual property intensive industries, that's a, that's a long term, but it's for those, it's those companies that rely on intellectual property, the brand to sell their products, trusted brands. They directly generate and support around 63 million jobs in Europe. And if you add then the companies that rely on those companies, um, it's about 84 million jobs. So um, the problem with this is that people see it as a kind of um, how does this affect me? And the, 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 the story about how big and damaging this problem is, is a more difficult one to actually push. Um, because you will get people saying, well, you know, it's Nike and who cares? You know, they they're not losing much money. It's GSK or Pfizer or whatever, you know, although they understand the, the, the complexities surrounding the dangers around those. But if, if they are massive companies like Procter and Gamble, people on the street are less caring. But then the message is the first of all, this is this is damaging jobs. Yeah. There are two things associated with it, apart from the damage that it does economically and to commerce. The one is the shift towards more dangerous household products. So these are the electrical goods that you see, um, uh, the um, anything, even foodstuffs, alcohol, uh, and I know you're interested in the automotive side of things. But again, you know, spare parts all of those things. And, you know, there are stories about, um, I'm sure you may have heard these, about uh, brake pads being made out of leaves, compressed leaves and all the rest of it. But it is true. Yeah. They, they, they have been. Now, before we left the EU, the customs figures, the EU customs figures that, that, were, being, that were reported were that 37% of, of fakes detained at EU borders were dangerous to the health and safety of the public. But the whole commercial um, system changed, didn't it? The logistical system changed. Yeah. And something else changed. And I, I noticed you, you picked up something in your questions. And that is the way that the fakes are distributed. Because they are now, the counterfeiters are now still using maritime for the great volume, yeah. but they're also using online. And that means a single packages arriving in the UK are overwhelming our border force. The other shift is, of course, that over the last 15 years, <coughs> organised criminality has become involved. But the money that they make, and I mentioned that £464 billion worth of, uh, dollars worth of trade, is being fed 
to other forms of criminality. And that's the message I think we need to be uh, getting across far more clearly that it's being used for drugs, weapons, people, you know, and child labour. Consumers have to think very much about the long game here, isn't there? There's a very selfish view of this of thinking, well, it's cheap. Yeah. I'll get it. So just using Evotech, for example, you know, they, they invest their time and resource into designing and making stuff in this country. Um, somebody else is copying it. Uh, it's it's not the same product. It's not the same materials or anything. But if somebody thinks, oh, that's fine. It's you know, I'm just going to buy this one. It's cheaper. The the very long term of this, if it just keeps going, is companies like that will shut down. Yes. And there'll be nothing for them to copy. But also, I think a, a lot of the message you've given has been how criminality is getting more and more of a foothold. And all we're doing is empowering them. And we'll end up. It, I know China, um, the Chinese criminals account for a lot of the um, counterfeiting stuff. But there is also a huge amount of product that worldwide we buy from China completely legitimately with very good production processes and yeah, you know, the quality control and the companies working them rely on China. But yes. it, we're, we're, we're handing all control of everything, the counterfeit and everything outside of our, well, we're handing it outside of our control. And the long game is, you know, buying that fake crash protector or fake watch or, you know, outside of the potentially horrific uh, dangers if you're buying toys and medicine and cosmetics mm. uh, and automotive parts. Yeah. So, you yeah, know, yeah. Brake pads made of leaves. And I've seen, you know, copies of Brembo calipers and things like that. Yes. We're creating this shift by feeding it in the same way that motorcycle theft is fed by a desire for cheap parts. Um, there's always yeah. another buck to be passed. We can blame the motorcycle manufacturers for making parts too expensive. But then we've got huge storage costs, import costs. It's a niche market. There's arguments either way. But ultimately, it seems to all come down to there are companies like there's groups like the ACG trying to fight this and working with businesses to stop this. But there's got to lay some responsibility with the buyer to think before you say, yeah, hey, well, it's yeah. cheap. Yeah, I think we have this bargain hunter mentality and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I fully appreciate that. And there are people who have less resources than perhaps you and I, um, financial resources, and are looking for the bargains to be able to, you know, gifts for Christmas and all the rest of it. And of course, the kind of it is know this, that, that, that's the business plan. They know this. Um, it doesn't stop you know, wealthy people buying them as well. But but they know this and, and that's how they, they're targeted. Um, and, and I think the, the message we want to get across particularly now is that is this shift from the fakes that you traditionally have bought towards the ones that can actually injure you, maim you, or, you, you, you know, God forbid, um, kill you really. Now for some people, the big savings will still be a huge temptation, but hopefully you've seen how wide a reaching issue this is. The thing is, not all fakes are obviously too cheap to be real. Bike Social member John Ashley had to report fake light tech chain adjuster to the official UK importer, Reactive Parts, after seeing them advertised on eBay for about three quarters of the full retail price. They keep springing up as the seller changes the username, and they now seem to be listed as new other. For £152, inferring that they're barely used. They might even show some original packaging in the listing, but you probably won't actually get that. The suspicion should be raised by the fact that the seller has hundreds of products to suit dozens of different bikes, all said to be new other. It's also odd that they're in the US, but have a UK warehouse. That doesn't sound like an individual selling a barely used second-hand bargain. Now with these particular parts costing £222.60 from the official UK importer, though again Bike Social members save 10%, you might be tempted, but keep in mind what one of the members of John's forum who had the set of those knockoffs that look very similar said on there. I had these on my bike, dropped it into third gear doing about 60 and the chain came off the rear sprocket. The screw adjuster had broken and the wheel shifted back, making the chain slack. Think before buying anything, use a legitimate dealer, and if buying used, see what else the seller is punting out. You'll soon separate the dodgy market for trader from the person who's just sold their bike and is making a few quid on the genuine parts. Buying fakes doesn't stick it to the man, and it could be downright dangerous. 
Fact is, some things might be expensive, but that doesn't always mean the work that went into them doesn't justify the cost. And turning to counterfeits isn't the answer. Look at it this way. What are the counterfeiters gonna copy if they put the people who do all the development and design work out of business? Do you want Tell me to me. start it and then you finish it? Um, can or do, yeah, 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 you have a go, yeah. Honestly, I'll, I'll have a go. Yeah. <laughs> Talk yeah. exactly as you normally would. Yeah. Imagine we're in a sundown or whatever. Don't, don't... This... John, I'm in, I'm in mother-in-law mode here. There's no <laughs> swearing <laughs> going to come out of me. I wish we could show this stuff, because it's actually, it, it, it's quite endearing, right? You know, the way you, you guys are so passionate about this stuff, but as soon as we get you in front of a camera, you're like, oh, you be really cool. no, honestly, you're literally okay. chatting to me about it. Tell yeah. me exactly what we've talked about all the years I've known you and stuff.